Warning. This program may contain material of an explicit or graphic nature. Viewer discretion is advised. Casting Undead from the B-Ward, this is the Postmortem Show. I'm Dom. And I'm JD. And today, we're going to bring you our top five years in horror. This was so research intensive. It was very research intensive. I went fucking nuts. Yeah. <laughs> There's a Wikipedia that helps, like, yeah. break down movies by year, but then you have to go, because it doesn't have hardly anything listed yeah. there. So you gotta go and do through the trenches of yeah. research. The, and, and, and the other thing was like, so it w- sometimes it wouldn't list the original one, but it would list the sequel. And you'd be like, oh yeah. So you'd have to click to the sequel and then and see the back. year that the original came yeah. out. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, a I, lot of research. But yeah. uh, it's going to be our personal five favorite years. Yeah. So. And what I did for mine is I, I started. I started in 1930 and went to 2017. So I went way the fuck back and. Um, Listed all the movies that I liked that came out those years, and then actually based the best years on the mo- years that had the most number of movies, and then I would differentiate it by quality. Yeah. And uh, I ended up keeping my whole list from 1930 to 2017, because, you know, maybe we'll want to do, like, best decades or something like yeah, that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I don't want to do, do this that. research again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It did take quite a while. I thought it was going to be an easy one, but no, not, yeah. a, not at all. And uh, mine is kind of more, I, I did do research and stuff, but I went with some nostalgia factor too, like yeah. certain years to where like, oh, all these movies that yeah. I grew up with came out that year. Well, and, that's that's kind of how I did it is like, if, if there were two years that had the same number of, of like awesome movies, I, and I based them on movies that were awesome or significant, even though, even if I don't particularly like them, but they were significant for something, um, then I would break the tie by the ones that I just liked more. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah, but before we get to that, we're going to have some horror news. Yeah. And before we get to that, I have some real life horror news. Yep. Because I almost died, Dom. Yeah. I almost died recently. Again. It wasn't even a bear this time. I. It wasn't a bear. You can go back and listen to my bear attack story. I have lived a, the life of a thousand men. Yeah. <laughs> what I mean is that, like, you'd expect, you know, fighting with barbed wire and fire and broken glass and going crazy and going off balconies and stuff. You expect, you know, that's going to do me in. But no, what almost did it was a El Monterey frozen bean burrito. <laughs> you eat light tubes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have bit through many fluorescent lights. I don't really chew and swallow yeah. them, but I bite through them. And it was the burrito. Maybe, you know what, though? What if it was, like, the bear? From the lake, sent it. <laughs> yeah, he, he set it up for you. It's, it's, it's a burrito. No, yeah, <laughs> fuck, man. So I took a bite of this burrito. First of all, I'm sick. I'm stuffed up. You know, and you can probably hear my voice. You know, I'm all plugged up and sore throat, especially now because of this story. Not even the sickness, but I fucking start choking on this burrito to the point where I'm bashing my chest. I'm trying to. There's no one here. I'm by myself. I'm at lunch from work. And eventually I'm on the ground accepting death, like my vision's starting to cloud and blacken, like to Jesus. that. Like seriously, it was that bad to where like I was going out, like I was choked out basically, yeah. going unconscious. And then all of a sudden it just violently expelled, like my body just forced it out and just like f- puked it all up, all crazy. And it was hardly anything, but like it got it out, right? But when that happened, my ear popped. Yeah. And. My ear's been fucking bothering me ever since. My throat. I went and saw the doctor today, and my eardrum didn't rupture or anything. It's just really raw, and the throat's really tender. You plus, I'm your sick. Eustachian tubes, yeah. Yeah, plus I'm sick, so I have that going for me, too. So, very painful weekend. Jesus Christ. <laughs> but I'm, I'm here. Yeah. The burrito didn't do me in. 
Nah. I'm not post mortem after all. Yeah, for real. <laughs> real post mortem. We would yeah. have to change Morty's picture to you. Yeah. <laughs> all blue on the ground. <laughs> so, not, not the fucking barbed wire. It's a burrito. Yeah. That's the story of my life. Wow. Bears in the woods randomly attacking me. Yeah. And you're a vegetarian. Yeah. Like, you know. El Monterey bean burritos. It's not like a hunk of meat <laughs> yeah. that you're choking on. It's, it's, it's the softest food there is. But it really. A soggy microwaved burrito. Yeah, it really goes to show, though, like. Anything can fucking kill you if you're not careful, you know? It's, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and when you're doing the death matches, you're careful. I thought <laughs> that it was almost like Final Destination when, I, when it was happening to yeah. me. Yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like karma just fucking ran out. <laughs> yeah. Time time to go. Yeah. I made peace with it, though. I was like, like yeah. Oh, you, I'm dead. You, you almost, I've had a good run. Yeah, you did. You had a, had, I'm glad you're alive, though. <laughs> Thank you. And you, you had a, you had a, a, a near death experience this weekend, and I'm starting, I started a new life this weekend. I moved in with Michelle this weekend. It's official. We're living together, and uh, I'm started antidepressants. I'm five days in, and I'm actually like waking up in the morning and getting out of bed as opposed to laying there for 15 minutes, convincing myself that life is worth living. <laughs> you're glowing, Dom. Yeah. You're glowing like a pregnant 14 year old girl. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know about the fourteen-year-old girl? <laughs> All right, that's awesome, and I'm very proud of you. And you know what I'm not proud of? El Monterey. Yeah, they manufacture a, a shoddy product at yeah. best. Two ninety-nine for a dozen burritos. You got to know there's something wrong. Something's gonna happen. <laughs> You're gonna die. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Before we get into our top five years in horror, we got a little bit of horror news. Horror news. So, I almost died. But I got a bit, little bit of real life horror news where someone did actually die. So, things are looking up for me too, you know? Yeah. You just started a new life, like you said. I'm still here. Yeah. I'm not dead. Yeah. I didn't choke out on the bean burrito. That's right. <laughs> I violently coughed it up and I feel like I'm dead, but I'm still here. I walk in some kind of purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> I walk alone! <laughs> I'm like a Godsmack album. <laughs> you walk for miles in this pit of Monterey burritos. <laughs> so, a homeless man killed his wife in an abandoned California restaurant, then dismembered her body, and carried it aboard a light rail train in a suitcase before burying her remains outside a home improvement store, LA police said on Tuesday. Jesus Christ. He was in the train with a suitcase full of body parts. A homeless guy in the corner. Wow. You're like, I don't want to make eye contact with yeah. him. Yeah. Maybe he's... Maybe, maybe he has a suitcase full of body parts. Yeah. Maybe, <laughs> or maybe he's going to ask me for change. <laughs> <laughs> so, investigators believe Valentino Gutierrez killed his wife last week in Pasadena. Deputy Chief Justin Eisenberg said he took the train a few stops, then rode his bicycle with a suitcase in tow to the parking lot of a Home Depot in the Cypress Park neighborhood. I know that Home Depot. <laughs> <laughs> where he set the suitcase ablaze. <laughs> <laughs> the killing was particularly disturbing homicide because of its sheer brutality. Jesus. Firefighters discovered the body parts after being called to the store around 1.30 a.m., police said on Thursday. Or, uh, 1.30 a.m. on Thursday. Co- coroner's officials have been unable to identify the remains or confirm whether the person was a man or woman, but believe the victim is Gutierrez's 31-year-old wife, Tiana Alfred, said Captain William Hayes. Detectives identified Gutierrez as a suspect after reviewing surveillance video that showed a man with a similar suitcase riding a light rail train, which led them to Pasadena. Police bloodhounds were able to track his movements. Several homeless people in the area identified him. Investigators have not yet found a motive, but he was arrested on Friday outside a homeless shelter where he had been staying. Wow. Murder hobos are still at it. (laughs) Yep. 56-year-old was charged with murder and arson and made <laughs> arson of a dead body. Yeah. Murder and arson, I guess that's one way to put it. After What about transporting uh, biohazards on a public train? Fucking charge charge him with it, man. Terrorism. Like that guy. Yeah. <laughs> so he made an initial court appearance, but denied enter a plea. The name of his defense attorney is not immediately known at this time. Wow. Biff, attorney at law. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> Are you a homeless man who chopped up your wife, <laughs> took her in a suitcase aboard a train, and then set her on fire outside of a Home Depot? I've got you covered. <laughs> Call one eight hundred Biff. You know they they say like you know it's cheaper to keep her. You know if you got marital problems, you've got even worse problems if you get divorced. But like, 
you know, I mean, you could just drop her up and put her in a suitcase and take her on a light rail and set her on fire in front of a Home Depot. Well, you know, when homeless people want to get away from it all, they go camping. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't have any firewood. And right. He, he went and bought a tent from the Home Depot, set it up in the parking lot, <laughs> lit his wife's body on fire in the suitcase out front. And he's like, what? You, I can't do that? But... You know, also, like, California is a 50% state. Like, as soon as you get married, like, you and everything that you and your spouse own, you now own 50% of it each. And if you get divorced, it gets split up 50% of it. But, like, homeless people don't have shit. So, you know, was he, was he worried he was going to lose half He of split her part? up into percentages. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So fucked up story. That is a fucked up story. I've got some fucked up uh, news also. I've uh, taken this, this uh, news from uh, Huffington Post's weird news section and it, uh they initially reported on it on the 9th of this month uh today is the 12th as of this recording but a legal battle is brewing between starbucks and a california family claiming they were served a bloody cup of frappuccino <laughs> <laughs> amanda vice says in the was it the tampon that gave it away or <laughs> <laughs> the vampuccino <laughs> Amanda Weiss says in a lawsuit against the coffee chain that Frappuccino she ordered for herself and her toddler from the San Bernardino Starbucks in February of 2016 came with a ghastly ingredient not typically found on the menu. She said that she noticed red stains on the drink she purchased for her daughter Peyton, who was two at the time. She was licking the whipped cream where it had been sitting on top. Weiss told CBS Los Angeles, describing the moment she noticed the drink was blood-infused. She said the Frappuccino had a strange metallic smell and that she noticed something else. There was blood on the inside rim of the cup. That's disgusting. Yeah. She reported the incident to Starbucks and they discovered that an employee had cut himself and been bleeding before he was removed from his workstation. At least it wasn't the tampon. That would yeah. have been so much worse. Tampon Frappuccinos, that's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to go with homeless disemboweled, dismemberment suitcases, but that's a mouthful. I can't even say it once right now. Tampon frappuccinos. Tampon frappuccinos. Tampuccinos. <laughs> uh, yeah, so, you know, when you go out and you get food from a, a place or a drink from a place where someone else prepares it for you, you take a look at it. Make sure there's no there's no blood in it. Make sure there's no tampons. <laughs> good, good advice. Solid <laughs> advice for the day. Oh, JD says, JD's word of advice for the day. Check for tampons before we're ingesting anything. Boop, boop, boop. <laughs> the more you know. <laughs> so, back to horror movie as opposed to real life horror. If you liked All Hallows Eve, you'll be happy to hear that Art the Clown is finally back in Terrifier, written and directed once again by Damien Leone, who made All Hallows Eve. While there wasn't All Hallows Eve 2, it didn't feature the crazy clown, but he's back with his own movie. Nice. The official synopsis a maniacal clown named Art terrorizes three young women on Halloween night and everyone else who stands in his way. Terrifier will be released in limited theaters on March 15th and 16th, and on video on demand in the U.S. on March 27th, from Epic Pictures and Dread Central Presents, arriving completely uncut. No kind of R-rated edit, nothing like that. Nice. Good. You can see the Red Band trailer on YouTube. It looks awesome. It's super gory. Art is creepy. Yeah. If you, if listeners, if you haven't seen All Hallows Eve, the first one, it's worth watching just for art. The second one sucks. He's not even in it. He was on your creepy clowns list, right? He was. I think he was my number one. Yeah. Yeah, he's the scariest clown ever. Yeah, definitely. And this Terrifier looks amazing. Actually, before All Hallows Eve, there was a short name Terrifier uh-huh. that the same director made about Art the Clown. Okay. And that's how he got to make All Hallows Eve. Now he's making an art official project. Okay, you know? cool. So Art the Clown... For my money, the creepiest clown there is. De- definitely one of the better, you know, attempts at creating a horror icon for the modern age. Yeah, white and black clown, too. You know, not a lot of cl- colors. Yeah. Not a Pennywise ripoff at all. Yeah. You know, nothing similar, you know. Something its own, you know. Yeah, for sure. Bloody Disgusting reports that the 1983 classic miniseries V is now being developed for a... Uh, trilogy of films by the original creator of the series who intends to write and direct the films. The first one is currently being set up for production. If it is successful, he'll uh, continue and make the epic vision that he always wanted to, but was 
controlled by budgetary constraints when he made the original series. i never seen that. The, is it good? You, you should check out the original series. They brought back a, a second series that wasn't as good, but the very first series, it's about these like lizard people, aliens, who come to Earth to take over, but some of them are good. Robert England actually plays the good lizard person alien. It's not the one where, where he's like a detective, but he's also an alien. Right? No, no. You know I, what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah, no. What's that called? I, I don't I don't remember what's around the same time, huh? Yeah. I always associate those two together, yeah. that's why I never watched yeah, it. Yeah, he's just like this dude who who comes down here with the aliens and like he marries a human and is like nice to people, but is a lizard person underneath. <laughs> uh, yeah, the original V, if you haven't seen it, see like, it. Out. Like the villain in Suburban Commando. <laughs> <laughs> when he gets hurt, he turns into a lizard person. He does. Yeah. See, Terrified is, me as a young man. Yeah, it was pretty pretty scary. <laughs> Um, check out the original V. I really liked it a lot. It's it's one of the first like really weird kind of left of center sci fi things that I remember ever really seeing. Okay. And, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see what this director does, uh, being able to bring his entire vision to fruition. All right. Well, back to real life horror news. <laughs> now shying away from the, the the movie stuff to get to the good stuff. We just talked about Exorcist 3 last episode. Got some real life Exorcist shit going on. Oh, really? Authorities say a woman in Anderson, South Carolina was found holding her eyeball outside of the South Carolina church. Anderson County Sheriff Chad McBride tells news outlets that it took two or three deputies, two emergency medical workers to subdue and restrain the woman to start rendering aid after she ripped her own eyes out. Jesus. In front of a church. Wow. Retired minister who helped the woman, Reverend Terry Mitchell, says it appeared she had intentionally hurt herself on nearby railroad tracks. He said the woman looked young and struggled against people who were trying to help her. Sheriff's office says deputies responded to assist emergency medical workers, but no crime was said to be committed. The woman was airlifted to a hospital to treat her injuries. South Main Chapel and Mercy Center worker Elizabeth Hyatt says the church held a debriefing to counsel those who saw what happened. That's because it terrified these people and scarred them so badly. I, I could see where it would. Did but she did just she, fuck you? <laughs> but she started pulling one of those. Too. Yeah. Or did she start screaming where we're going? You don't need eyes to see. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. That's some <laughs> shit. Yeah. People are coming out of their Sunday morning service and she's out there clawing her eyes out screaming. Yeah. <laughs> Fighting off five grown men. What did they say? Two emergency medical workers and three deputies. Was she on bath salts? <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> she was on worse than bath salts. Bath salts. She was uh, on uh, Baphomet. <laughs> Baphomet salts. Baphomet salts. <laughs> I don't know. I'd probably do Baphomet salts. <laughs> you probably would. <laughs> Go rip my eyes out in front of a church too. <laughs> it, it would be worth it. <laughs> All right. We will be back with Dom and JD at the movies. Yeah. We didn't even talk about that. At the movies coming up right after this. And we would like to invite you guys to join the Postmortem Show Patreon. That's right. We've asked you for over 100 episodes now through our Amazon link and other things that we do to support our filthy, filthy habit. But now we're asking you to help us help you. And that means help us cram a bunch of weird shit into your brain. And indeed. And the thing about it is is that you're always going to get the same Postmortem Show you've always got. From week to week, we've been producing a show every week. Of varying quality. Varying quality. <laughs> varying amounts of sobriety. Yeah. But. It's usually. Uh, the uh, the <laughs> fact <laughs> of the matter is, is that if you donate to us on Patreon, no matter how small, you're going to get bonus content. Yeah. We've we're got spending, all kinds of stuff planned. We're spending hours and hours with this extra content, you know, with our off topic. There's a lot of research that goes into that. Yep. We're putting together these off-topic things where we talk about things that interest us that we may touch on on the show but don't necessarily have time to go fully in-depth on. We're going to be doing creepy pastas. We're going to be doing video content with footage from the recording of our show, with uh, sketch comedy. Whatever weird shit that pop- bubbles up in our brain, we're just going to diary it out there. And, you know, hopefully you'll get it and you'll like it. Indeed. And the fact is, I don't know why I say indeed so much. Indeed. Right now. I'm I'm the postmortem show Funaki. <laughs> Evil. Anyways, with the Patreon, one dollar, five dollar, ten dollar, twenty dollar, fifty, a hundred, you're gonna get various levels of extra shit, including going to eat dinner with Dom and JD. Off of Dom and JD. Off of Dom and JD, where we pay for your meal, we pay for your movie. 
We sit together. We cover ourselves in sushi night, and let you eat it barehanded. Dom is going to spread his hairy Italian butt cheeks <laughs> and give you the goods. <laughs> That's not how it happens. <laughs> but we are going to be putting together shirts and stickers and you know all kinds of other cool physical merch that we're going to... Anything that we, that, that we release, we're going to kick over to our patrons. That includes our music, uh, JD's band, my various musical projects. If you're our patrons... That's going to give you access to that right off the bat for free. You want to see, speaking of Gigi Allen, <laughs> you want to see videos of me cutting myself and bleeding everywhere or getting cut by other people? You've came to the right place. Hey! Because you're going to get the best of JD Horror, West Coast Deathmatch, and DVD included for free. Video download. That's right. We're going to just throw it out there and see what sticks. It's like our fish, except we don't throw it back. We throw it to you, and you catch it, and you consume it. And if you like it, great. And if you don't, then fuck you. And you know what they say. You can give a man a fish, or you can teach that man to fish. Yeah. And I'm not sure how that applies to what we're doing here. Uh, Well, that's what Biff told me. Oh, okay. Listen to Biff. Anyways, patreon.com, postmortem show, horror movie podcast. Search us up. A dollar, if you're listening to this and you're a fan and you listen to every show, one dollar a month, it's not going to make a difference in your life, but it's going to make a difference in the quality of the show and in our life. Absolutely. It's going to enable us to bring you more content and, you know, maybe one day we could theoretically do this as our actual job and not have to spend 40 plus hours a week whiling away in fucking corporate nonsense when we can just be giving you cool shit. Thank you, guys. Check out the Patreon postmortemshow.com Let's go down to the movies with Dom and JD the blood boobies and Dungeons Psychos, monsters, bloody slashes maniacs and tits and asses chainsaws, knives and facial bashes on postmortem Let's go down to the movies with Dom and JD for some more Okay, we're back, and this week we have for you guys Mom and Dad yep. and Hellraiser Judgment. Two movies we've talked a lot about yep. in our news segments and much anticipated here on the Postmortem Show. Something so, we've been paying attention to. I was really excited to throw on both of these movies. Me too. So let's start off with Mom and Dad, 2017, written and directed by Brian Taylor, starring Nicolas Cage, Selma Blair, Ann Winders, Zachary Arthur. The cameo from Lance Hager- Hendrickson, Mom and Dad. A teenage girl and her little brother must survive a wild 24 hours during which a mass hysteria of unknown origins causes all parents to turn violently on their own children and no one else. Yep. Must kill your own children. Don't care about anybody else. Yeah, like they, they be would, nice to everybody yeah, else. Yeah, like they'd be nice to everyone. Life. Hey, how's it going? Yeah. <laughs> Gotta find my kids. Oh yeah, me too. Yeah. Trying to find my kids. <laughs> that fucking little bastard. <laughs> I really like this movie. Yeah, I, it was pretty good. Uh, the '70s style opening credits that had me hooked right yeah, in the beginning, right away. It's yeah. got a cool, sc- cool score. Um, Nicholas Cage doing Nicholas Cage things. Yeah, like a dance and construction montage, wearing a misfit shirt while Reagan Youth plays in the backgrounds, and then going batshit crazy, <laughs> smashing <laughs> a pool table with a sledgehammer. A lot of Reagan Youth is crazy. I appreciate yeah, I that. Yeah, yeah, I think this this director uh, definitely had his uh, had his music taste slipped into it. Um, I thought that the story of this movie felt like Romero's The Crazies, but had an original spin on it to make it its own. It's a story that's been told before yeah. in different ways, but it's but its own thing, too. The, this one, it, it was its own thing, I, I think in part because it had a focus beyond just the horror of people going crazy and killing other people. There was like this whole concept of identity that was wrapped up in the whole movie. Yeah, the, the monologue he does. Yeah. How we're not, we're just mom and dad now. Yeah. You know? And, and how e- each character, uh, the, you know, the daughter was a teenager who was completely wrapped up in her own identity, which made her a selfish bitch. The mom had completely lost her own identity to being a parent, which made her a wreck. And then the dad was right in the middle where, like, he was trying desperately to cling on to his previous identity. Yeah, midlife crisis, too. Be, be trying to make a man cave in the basement. His wife questions him on it, and he just destroys his pool table that he yeah. just built with a sledgehammer. Yeah. He's a major douche in this movie. He is. Well, and, except for the, the one scene where he's, he's sitting outside 
talking with his son about how when he was a kid and, and he fucked up and how it's like the the job of a kid to fuck up basically. Yeah. Oh no, he's cool before he's cool with the kids yeah. before he uh makes the turn, you know, when everyone goes crazy. Yeah. But he's a fucking asshole to the wife. Yeah, he is. You know, and he's just kind of an unlikable douche right. in in general, but his monologue and his speech and everything like that. Yeah. This that's what differentiated this movie from a lot of other everyone goes crazy, blah blah blah, yeah. you know. 28 days later kind of movie, you know. And, and they're still themselves, too. Yeah, and, and it was funny how, like, when they go crazy, like, it seems like mom and the mom and dad characters, like, remembered why they love each other while they're trying to kill their kids. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, they got closer. Yeah. And it's cool because, like, when she finally comes back to the house and stuff like that, they instantly they just like, they just click. They just look at each other and click, and they're like, yeah. so how are we going to do this? It's on. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, he's he's willing to um, admit her expertise in things. Finally, yeah, <laughs> it's a saws all. It saws all. <laughs> yeah, they kept going back to that too much for my taste. Yeah, so they kind of, they kind of ran that dry. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't like the daughter. <laughs> they humped the joke the joke to death. You know, I, I didn't like her in the beginning, and I think that was kind of the point. Because, but as she started taking responsibility for trying to save her little brother, I thought she became a little bit more of a sympathetic yeah, she character. did. Yeah, but like in her general setup, yeah, it took some getting used to and like endearing by helping the little brother to yeah. to kind of root for. Her, but yeah. like in the beginning, I was just like, oh, she was fuck. a fucking bitch. Oh, she dies instantly. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, Nicholas Cage, like I said, he, he's he's like Two Face. He's crazy. And then he's a good dad, and then he's fucking Nicholas Cage, and then he's being a douche, but then he's saying thoughtful things. Yeah. Like, I don't know about his character, whether I like it or not. Selma Blair, I kind of liked her character. Yeah. Um, I felt bad for her. And uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but Lance Hedrickson's character, I don't want to say who he is or what happens so with So fucking badass. He's awesome. Yeah. And he just, that that made the movie. That, yeah. Like, that little twist made the movie. Yeah. And he, I don't want to spoil it. He's really only in the movie for, like, five minutes. Yeah. But it's so fucking good. Yeah. yeah. And it, just the whole concept of it, it's, it's really funny. Yeah. And it made me, it, I laughed out loud when, I, when that was happening, so. I think Selma Blair is really underrated as an actress. Yeah, she yeah. she really had a really wide range of emotion in this movie, and and tends to have that in all of the movies that she's in. She just doesn't really you know get a whole lot of parts. And but, then Nicolas Cage is both over and underrated. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> <laughs> I like him though. <laughs> I like him only when he's doing movies like this. Right. I don't like him when he's doing major Hollywood movies. Yeah, and it's fucking horrible. When but he's when doing he's little movies like Eight fun Millimeter, being a fucking maniac. This and yeah. fuck, his old shit when he was being batshit crazy. Yeah. And, Bad Lieutenant Protocol. Yeah, like that kind of stuff. Like he's he's always good in that kind of stuff. So. For sure. I thought the movie was really, really well made in terms of the direction. This this guy also made the movies Crank and Gamer, which were like all ramp, ramped up to eleven. Yeah, and I was I was looking at what else he did, and I didn't watch any of those movies, and I never wanted to. I, I've know, seen all of them, and I, I enjoyed them all, but all of them are like super over the top. Always ramped up, ramped up to eleven, just fast paced action. And in this movie, he actually showed his range as a director by creating this subtle undercurrent of yeah. something is wrong. Well, he in the also beginning. wrote it too. That's yeah. the thing too. Yeah, I don't know if he wrote those other movies. Probably I'm not I mean, sure. I yeah. Imagine if he wrote this, but but yeah, he 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 was just the direction on it was very very solid. The way he kind of cut around to to disorient on purpose, but then brought everything back together. And fucking A, he used fucking practical special effects. Yeah. Even the explosion. <laughs> and with this movie, it would, like, there's a scene where there's an explosion. And if that explosion was crappy CG, it would have taken me entirely out of this movie. The way everything else was set up so realistic. Yeah. Because the way he does his violence is realistic. Like, it looked swift and brutal, even if the yeah. gore was off camera. Except for, like, the boyfriend who kept getting fucked up. Yeah. You know, all, all that gore was on camera, but all the other gore, they kind of implied it. But, like, the fight scene. No, there's, were... a, there's a pretty good gore scene. I can't say the, what it is. Oh, but... and the baby yeah. scene. The scene, yeah. the scene where the... Oh, God, that, that scene was intense as yeah. fuck. Definitely. So, I didn't like the ending at all. No. It just kind of stops. Yeah. Like, I don't like that. Yeah. Could it give me a little bit more? I don't need it wrapped up in a tight little bow or anything. Mm. But give me something. Yeah. It, it wouldn't need an explanation, but it needs some sort of resolution other than, than what we got. And I, I get that they were trying to tie the ending back to a conversation that the mom and daughter have in the beginning of the movie. But it just feels like he ran out of ideas. Yeah. IMDb gives this only 5.6. Wow, I think it's better than that. Yeah, I think it's better than that. Um, I think I'm right around 7. 7 
tampon frappuccinos. I gave it seven and a half tampon frappuccinos. Okay. I, th- I thought it could have been gorier, especially since it's not like a major Hollywood motion picture, and it could have had a better ending. But other than that, it was a satisfying movie. Yeah, I, when it was when it was done, it was definitely worth watching, and we recommend checking it absolutely. out. Absolutely, like, seven is a good rating. It's yeah. not a bad. You yeah. know, I just I think sometimes we get a little too carried away, and you know, when you think about like, okay, if a ten is Reanimator, then what's a nine? What's an eight? What's a seven? Okay, right. this is about a seven. When I think when I compare it like that, you know, yeah, yeah this is definitely a movie that, that I recommend people watch. It's a lot of fun. You don't have to think about it. You know, it's just a, a good. Old fashioned, fucked up horror movie. Yeah. Good stuff, too. And Nicolas Cage, I mean, I wish he would do more of this. Yeah. And I want to see the next movie that this guy makes. Uh, I don't want to see those action movies. I have no interest in that. Like They're, just... they're funny, though. They're, they're like action comedy. Action comedies. comedy. Yeah. yeah. And, and super over the top. I, I think you, you would probably enjoy Gamer. I don't know if you would enjoy Crank as much, um, but Gamer's a, a neat movie. Maybe I'll check it out, but I'll, I'll probably wait to see something else that he makes that's horror related, you know? Hmm. Because we have to watch a lot of movies for the show. Yeah, for real. <laughs> I don't have time to watch no action comedies. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so that's it for Mom and Dad. Now let's get into our next movie of the week, Hellraiser Judgment. It finally came. It finally came. 2018, written and directed by Gary J. Tunicliffe, who also stars alongside Randy Wayne, Damon Carney, and Alexandra Harris with a cameo by... Heather Langenkamp, and now Paul T. Taylor as Pinhead. So, not going to get your Doug Bradley no. as much as we all want it. Detectives Sean and David Carter are on the case to find a gruesome serial killer terrorizing the city. Joining forces with Detective Christina Edgerton, they dig deeper into the spiraling maze of horror that may not be of this world. I really wanted to like this movie more than I did. I thought it started out strong, but the more it went on, the more the cracks and flaws began to show in it. That is my, that's exactly what I would say. From the beginning scene, I thought Paul T. Taylor, although not Doug Bradley, was a good choice for Pinhead. Initially, yeah. And then the cold open is amazing yeah. of this movie. The, the auditor is a fucking awesome character. Great character. Awesome practical effects. Although a little corny, the cold open was one of the best I've seen in a long time. It delivers on an iconic new character of the auditor. I want to see more of this guy. Yeah, for you know? sure. And that's a, that's Gary uh, Gary J. Tunicliffe, the writer and director, is the auditor. Yeah. I, I like the idea of having Hell become a sort of bureaucracy with the whole auditing process. And I like how they depicted it as a combination of like a red tape corporate regimen mixed with an occult ritual. And I thought that the Hell characters were all interesting, really neat looking. They doubled down on the pain is pleasure and the psychosexual aspect of it. Um, and I liked the idea of how they sort of explore how Hell is a function of heaven and that God allows horrific things to happen in the world because those events make people faithful. Um, but and, and as like, it went on, I thought that the story got unnecessarily convoluted and it felt like Gary Tunnicliffe had an idea for a really cool story about hell and kind of tried to shoehorn it into the Hellraiser. And and kind of shoehorn yeah, it into world. Seven as well. Yeah. So, like, okay, so, but just still with the cold open, before you even get the opening credits, it gives a great setup, it gives awesome brutality, and it gives TNA. Yeah. There's a lot of nudity, there's a lot of Hellraiser, kind of, like you said, a bunch of psychosexual elements, and... uh then we get to the main plot, which is a serial killer called the Perceptor, who's reminiscent of Seven, but instead of the deadly sins, it's the Ten Commandments. It's basically the same thing. Right. So you get the two detectives and a female detective, like Mindhunter. So it's like Mindhunter and Seven. And Silence and, of the Lambs. And Silence and, of the yeah. Lambs and Hellraiser all combined, taking elements of all these. The plot is super convoluted, mm. like you said. It gets a little predictable. You can see the twist coming from a mile away. And, and I really didn't want that twist. And it wasn't because I, I, I liked the characters that the twist went into. It was just because it was such a fucking obvious twist. Yeah. Yeah, you saw it come from a mile away. I would say that the direction is better than the writing. Yeah, for sure. But I don't want to say it's bad writing because that cold open and that premise, yeah. if you didn't have the Ten Commandments thing and you didn't have... The whole Perceptor, you know, that whole, and the whole uh, detectives, noir, kind of trying to go for it, reaching, grasping. It's kind of like uh, Hellraiser Inferno is like that in a way, but it kind of works for me in Hellraiser Inferno right. more than it does in this one. 
And uh, it would have been better if it was just that cold open and more of that. Yeah, more and of more that. Di- more of that and the different stages and then, the, you know, Maybe a character escalating. realizing some of horrible things that they did that they didn't, yeah. you know, that they had blocked But you didn't need the serial killer with the Ten Commandments. Yeah. You didn't need the females with the female cop coming into the two brother detectives. First of all, two brothers that are both serial killer detectives... That are way opposite ages. Yeah. And it just works and they just have this office together. What the fuck? Like, how likely is that? Like, it it might have been better even if they wanted to go with the whole detective noir thing. If they were private detectives investigating something. And they didn't even have to deal with the the whole police procedural aspect of it. You know, two two brothers being private, you know, gumshoes makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. The family business kind of thing. As opposed to like, okay, so the older brother would have probably been a much higher rank and had like a better office. Like, let's be honest, the way things work, like in in the police and stuff, they wouldn't have the same job unless he's just a major fuck up. But they kind of get into that. He did kind of fuck up a little bit. And and I don't think that they would make (laughs) brothers partners in a police thing because there would be like a conflict of interest if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And I also thought that the female character was entirely unnecessary. The female detective was entirely unnecessary. But she was good, though. She was good. She was good. Yeah. Like, all the things, like, all the acting in this movie is good. Right. Like, everyone's good. And everyone, like, you could, this movie could have, they could have taken this idea and made it into four movies. Yeah. Like, there's so much here, you know, that they could have done it all about the the concept of the order of hell and the judgments, like a trial, there's a jury, you know, it's just, that whole thing, they could have went with that and just had different people Go till finally somebody is found not guilty and gets to leave, and that's the end right. of the movie or something. Exactly, you know, in this big trial thing. Yeah, and that's the whole movie. That's fine. And then you could go and have the auditor and stuff audit, set up this detective world, have him audit him, blah blah blah. And then you could have the Ten Commandments killer. All this stuff. It could be more. It doesn't just shoehorned in. And this movie is not that long. No, either. it's not. It's not even ninety minutes. Like yeah, an hour and twenty minutes. Yeah, for all that to be happening, that's a lot of fucking plot to go. So it just yeah. kind of jumps. Um, yeah, you, you'd mentioned that the acting was good. I really like Gary Toncliffe as, as the, uh, the auditor. I think that he probably put more thought into that part than he did than the, for the rest of the movie. Like yeah. that, that was his baby in all of this. And I almost felt like Pinhead was kind of unnecessary in this other than it was a Hellraiser movie and they had to fit him in there. Yeah, it's one. It's and, similar and, to like some of the last sequels to to Hellraiser, and even Inferno, to where it's just there in certain parts, and they're that's the concept of the movie is the box and yeah. hell and all the stuff like that. So he's going to be there because he's got to be. Yeah, and but not, he's not really necessary. Yeah, not to give away the ending of it, but I, I think that the ending is also if Gary Tonicliffe wants to make more movies, I think he will focus them more on the auditor and. And there's this whole, like, angel and demon pissing contest sequence at the end of the movie that I didn't like. Yeah. Um, the, but That I, whole thing that was whole, unnecessary. Like, that, and that was Pinhead's whole yeah. through line but was that. I, and I, I didn't like it. Yeah, I think that whole thing was designed to um, shift the focus of future movies more to the auditor and less to Pinhead. Yeah. Uh, in the beginning, when you meet the auditor and Pinhead, when Pinhead... The beginning of the movie is Pinhead. Like, yeah. it, he does open before... You get to anything else. Yeah. I thought that the auditor, based on his glasses and his character and the way he sounded, kind of was the what's Jeff Platcha guy? You know that the guy. Yeah, a little. I bit, thought it yeah. was that, but then I realized it wasn't him. It's a new character, but he kind of looked like him a little bit in the face the way he was. Mm. So I was kind of confused at first until we got to like see the whole auditor thing. Yeah. So one thing that I really liked about Pinhead in this movie, though, and I think that that Paul Taylor did a good job of conveying this in the beginning. Is that, you know, they talked in the very beginning about how things have changed for hell and how, you know, pleasures and pain have changed through internet culture and things like that. And depicting hell as more of a bureaucracy and Pinhead was so bored in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Like he would just sit there and fucking stare at the wall, like with his his, his f- hand on his forehead. Yeah, his uh, chair was facing the wall. Yeah. I thought it was really weird. And it was just like he'd, he'd, hell had become such a bureaucracy that it almost had broken him down. And then when shit got fucked up, and then he starts to try to run he's, a little bit wild, yeah, he, and he gets happy again. Yeah, yeah, he tries to have his moment to shine. I think that Paul Taylor didn't bring the same gravitas to that section that Doug Bradley would have. There was just a certain oomph that was missing that that Bradley had, and 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 Taylor just didn't. But in the the first half of the movie, that depiction of Pinhead, I thought was very interesting. Yeah, the whole angel thing though kind of lost me. Yeah, and it's cool that you get the chatter. You know, yeah. a special actor for that, but they remade the chatter. It looked exactly like yeah, it looked great. Yeah, and then they they kind of went with something that was the bane of the first movie, where they threw a little bit of that fake lightning and electricity on the box <laughs> and stuff. 
<laughs> and it's fun. Come yeah. on, man. It's 2018. You don't need that. Yeah. You know, that that stuff was unnecessary. But I'll let it go because it's kind of a throwback. This is closer to some of the first movies than some of the recent movies it, have been. It felt very Clive Barker. Yeah. yeah. This guy definitely did his... He definitely read some of Clive Barker's short stories or, or his books and and sort of captured that feel. Uh, and he, the other thing that I think really helped is that he really, really focused this on practical effects. There was yeah. only one digital effect, other than the, the shitty lightning, there was only one digital gore effect. It was the Jesus wept moment in the very end. Yeah. And I, I hated it. Yeah. But all of the other practical effects were good. And, I and fucking, that was reaching to, you don't need to quote yeah. the, the original movie to try to pop the audience, yeah. the nostalgia and stuff. It so. didn't work. You it's know what the, I loved though? I loved the butcher surgeon. Mm-hmm. That thing was awesome. It's Ace Ventura 2 when nature calls. <laughs> That's all it was. You just stole that and put it into a horror element. Yeah. When the little guy comes out of the backpack. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 the way that they pulled it off. I mean, the, the physical actors they had doing that were clearly like dancers or something like that. Yeah. The, the, the whole just movement thing and how yeah. what one kind of popped out of the other like a fucking death pop. Yeah, it was pretty cool. This is not the best horror wizard movie by any means, but it's not Revelations. No. So I would say, as of now, my order would be Hellraiser 1, number 2 for me, Hellraiser Bloodline, I know a lot of people hate it, Hellraiser in Space, I love the fucking, the box, the where where it all started in the, like, the French through line in it. Then I would go with number 2, number 3, Inferno, Hellseeker, Judgment, this new one, then Hellworld, Dead or Tide, and then Revelation, so... I think there's only three Hellraiser movies that are worse than this. Yeah, that's fair. I and I think that uh, for my list, I would invert uh, Hellraiser Bloodline and Hellraiser Two. I think Hellraiser Two is, is my would be a number two on my list. Yeah, um, but it was it was good. You know, it, yeah. it, it was okay. I hey, I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed yeah. it when I was watching it. I had my I nitpicked it, and mm. it's definitely not going to change the world. Right, but I. Was happy, and we're—I mean—we're Hellraiser fans. We grew up with Hellraiser, that the cold, original movies. So yeah. we're going we're gonna to be critical. Yeah, and that cold open though, like if that cold open wasn't so good, mm. I probably would have rated this several points lower, and it probably wouldn't have got me so much. Mm. But that was so good that the rest of it, when it got convoluted and stuff, I could forgive it. Yeah, because that beginning. So just good. that beginning scene, like if you just had nothing but that yeah. as a short film, fuck. I would have watched. Yeah, yeah. And if Gary Tunnicliffe makes another Hellraiser movie. I will watch it. I will watch it too, and I also will watch anything else he makes. Yeah, because although the writing is a little convoluted, there's a lot here. Yeah. There's a lot. There's way more positive than negative. And and it could also be a case that you know he wasn't sure if he was going to get another movie, so he kind of tried to put as much if he could of this more epic story arc that he had into one film. Uh, but yeah, I hope he gets another opportunity, and I hope we get more of the auditor. You know, I, I I would be good with having the future of Hellraiser have no pinhead and have the auditor be the character that he, the torch is passed to. Uh, you know, I, I I still want a little bit of pinhead, but it's okay if they have it minimal like it was right now, and you have more of that. So you get great gore, you get a new iconic character, the auditor, some old favorites, great concept in the auditor, assessor, jury, surgeon, and butcher, but poor writing in the plot that backs it up. Cold Open made me think I was going to love this movie, but the longer it went, I just started tacking off more and more points. But I did end up with Evgeny Malkin, my favorite Russian bear. Yeah. One of my favorite hockey players of all time, Evgeny Malkin on the Penguins. Number 71. 7.1. 7.1 tampon frappuccinos. Wow. Nice. I give it uh, six and a half. 6.5 okay. tampon frappuccinos. Uh, I also thought it was silly that they gave Heather Langenkamp top billing, and she was just in this like throwaway part for 30 yeah, seconds. Yeah, that was stupid. Yeah. I don't even know why. She didn't even need it. And at first, I didn't even recognize her. Yeah. I had to look at IMDb. Yeah, know, they because they put her in like meth head makeup kind yeah, of. Yeah, and it's and she had like CGI extra chins. Yeah. Or like makeup extra chins or something. Or yeah. Maybe she just let herself go. I don't maybe. know. But I did not recognize her at first. And uh, she was in Hellraiser Hellseeker. That's right. Yeah, and she was good in that. So yeah. I thought maybe, you know, it'd be some kind of throwback to that. Bring back her character. No, it wasn't that, so. But yeah, I would recommend checking him out. It looks like Dom liked Mom and Dad a little bit more than I did, and I like Kelly's or Judgment a little bit more than Dom did. So we're pretty even. Yeah. This week. So. And, and we're this not saying... We didn't get a stinker. We got two movies that are both passable, watchable yeah. movies. Yeah, we're, we're not saying don't watch Hellraiser uh, Judgment. Like, definitely watch it when when you can get your oh, yeah. hands on it. Yeah, it's, Just watch that cold open, and then if you don't watch the rest, you'll still love it. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that's it for At The Movies. We will be back with our top five years in horror after this. 
Thank you guys for all your support. You know, sharing our shit, liking our page, listening, listening weekly, not suing us, semi weekly, getting semi hard for thirty seconds once. Yeah, <laughs> no matter how long you listen, we still support, we still support you. Unless it is just one episode, then fuck you. Yeah, you better run, run for the yeah. fucking hills, run but through the jungle. That's not what this is about. No. What this is about is we have now started the official Facebook group of. Postmortem Show. Go on Facebook, look up Postmortem Show Horror Movie Podcast for a chance to share your favorite horror memes with us and occasionally be shit talked by me. <laughs> That's probably <laughs> accurate. Yeah, I've already done it once. <laughs> yeah, guys, uh, yeah, join the group. Um, we have thousands of listeners to the show. Right now, the group only has about 300 members. Yeah. So please add yourself, please share it. Share it with the world. Yeah. Just don't say stupid Let ass Let us into your shit. lives. Let us into your lives. Yeah. O- open you yourself to me. Open you yourself to, to us. You want to talk to Biff? We will, we will soon put, to be one-eared Biff. We will put Biff on the computer if that's what you want. We're going to have an official event in the group. It's going to be Facebook Live Q&A with Biff. And I'm just going to put Biff on Facebook Live sitting there. <laughs> and he'll answer all your questions. Maybe we could do it as like a video chat thing. <laughs> Yeah, so that's uh, official Facebook group, Postmortem Show Horror Movie Podcast. Please join, please share it with your friends. So, Dom, I have uh, burrito injuries, so this week I'm going to need you to handle that. And we're back! There you go. I didn't do it very good. You, you got one more try. Go ahead. And we're back! <laughs> My scream is different than yours. Hey, <laughs> we're back! That was way better. I had, I had to do it See, I, I was the Paul T. Taylor, and you were the Doug Bradley of, of, of <laughs> And we're back. <laughs> I'm going to pay for it later. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> You're bleeding out of your mouth right now. <laughs> <laughs> it was worth it. I regret nothing. You know what? You know what? This is the worst part of that story. I didn't get into that in the news. This was where everyone would not feel bad for me anymore. So I choked, almost choked to death on this burrito. Before we get into our top five years of horror, I almost choked to death on this burrito. I don't know if I told my wife this or not, but I'll tell you, and I'll tell all of our listeners. And she, if she listens to the show, then she'll she'll get it. But I almost choked to death on the burrito. Accepted death. Coughed the burrito up. Ugh. Composed myself, you know, sat there 15, 20 minutes, just like dying, like, oh, fuck. (laughs) Just feeling really weird, you know, got some stuff to drink, got some stuff to drink. I was on my lunch break, and I microwaved two El Monterey burritos. (laughs) I think I know where this is going. So after 15 or 20 minutes of suffering, I ate the second (laughs) burrito. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, (laughs) <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> Ugh, it, it sucks, but hey, waste not, want not. You know? Hey, yeah, <laughs> still got to eat, even if you almost die. <laughs> Why don't you start us off this week? All right. So, as I said, uh, the way that I, I handled this is I, I looked at all the years from 1930 to 2017. I pulled out all the years that had all the significant movies and the movies I really liked from that year, and then I based it on which ones had the most significant movies or movies that I liked. And if there was a tie, I broke it by just how much I liked the movies. So some of these years may come up as kind of weird, but uh, there was a method to my madness. So for my number five, my year is 2014. That year we had nine good or significant movies, a couple that I really liked. Uh, Annabelle was significant because it was very successful, but we also had The Babadook, Creep, A Girl Walks Home, Alone at Night, Housebound, Oculus, Starry Eyes, Tusk, and Zombievers. Yeah, and um, there's a little bit more, actually. I, this is on my honorable mention. It almost made my top five, believe it or not. But uh, also, ABC's of Death 2 came oh, out yeah. that year. Wild Tales, which you still have not seen. Have that not might seen be your it. next Watch This Fucker movie. Maps of the Stars? Good movie, yeah. 13 Sins. Yeah. You see 13 Sins? I have not. It's good, too. I think that's on Netflix, isn't it? It is, yeah. I think it, it, it was. I know it's on Amazon Prime still. But yeah, um, 2014 was a pretty good year for horror. So, All right, my number five. 
one of these movies I talked about a little bit earlier on the show, but a year that's very near and dear to my heart is 1996. The Frighteners from Dust Till Dawn, Hellraiser Bloodline, Scream, Thinner, Bordello of Blood, Freeway, a bunch of movies that I watched, you know, Scream being the lesser of all those, right. but it came out that year, worth being mentioned. Uh, movies that I loved as a kid. I was 11 years old in 1996, born in 85. And that was when, you know, I remember having the Hellraiser Bloodline movie poster I got from the Family Video, Mm -hmm. VHS video store (laughs) on the corner a couple blocks away from my house. The guy would let us put our uh, names on the back of posters. Yeah. And if you had done it and no one else did it, by the time that poster was ready to go, he would roll it up and put it in the back. And then if you saw it was gone, you can come and ask for it. And he'd just give it to you. Yeah, the yeah. Napomo video where I grew up used to do the same thing. Also, also uh, where I got my Reanimator unrated VHS copy, right? That I still have to this day. That just blew my mind was from that family video. I got Maniac Cop there. I got a bunch of things that I had never seen before. You know, because you had a bunch of obscure ones and these weird packs. Like rent these three movies for five dollars, and it'd be like Maniac one, two, and three. Oh wow! You know, That's Maniac cool. Cop one, two, and three. Like you'd have these own little things that he like grouped together in his own thing later turned out to uh be some kind of like weird sexual predator or something this guy that owns this video oh, store. Whoa, shit. <laughs> with the portos in the back and stuff very surprising but i don't think he got like i remember it got shut down but i remember some hearing something that he sexually harassed some like teenage girl in there so fuck that guy but thank you for the videos that's right and he served his purpose <laughs> yeah. 1996 solid year solid year fuck that guy but fuck that guy. <laughs> I'm about putting over the the family video. <laughs> and then at the end, I I didn't even th- think about that guy or that store until I started talking about this. <laughs> so now I feel bad about even mentioning the family video on Ocean Avenue in Lompoc, California. <laughs> <laughs> All right. My number four. With ten good or significant movies, 1988. We got The Blob, Brain Damage, Child's Play, Elvira, Mistress of the Dark, Killer Clowns from Outer Space, Maniac Cop, Night of the Demons, Pumpkinhead, The Serpent in the Rainbow, and Waxwork. That's a pretty good fucking list. That's a fucking, that's a year with a pedigree right there. It is. Night of the Demons, man. First horror movie I remember seeing. Yeah. Love it. That's a good year, 1988. Almost made my list. It's on my honorable mentions, but uh, my number four... Some of my some of my list is in groupings, and I really did do a lot of research. It's going to seem like I didn't because it's just like a lot of them are really close together. Mm-hmm. But I have a lot of honorable mentions, so that'll prove I did my research, Tom. <laughs> I didn't just spit out whatever came naturally. But if I did, it probably would be these same years. Seventeen thirty-five. <laughs> <laughs> my number four is nineteen ninety-five. All right, one year prior to my number five, which we got Demon Knight, Ice Cream Man. Lord of Illusions, The Prophecy, Seven, Tales from the Hood, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, The Next Generation, Welcome to the Dollhouse. Good year. Bunch of good fucking movies. Horror took a, like, a little serious, after the late 80s, like, let's make our horror icons cool, early 90s cheesiness. Besides Ice Cream Man, it kind of took a serious turn there with uh, Lord of Illusions, The Prophecy, and Seven. Yeah. You know, those are some quality films. Yeah. You know, all those hold up. I love Lord of Illusions. To death, I know the CGI like folding guy is stupid, terrible, but... but everything else is good, and that's one that could deserve a remake. Yeah, too bad that the guy from Super Troopers that played Nix died. Oh, he did. Daniel Von Bargen, yeah, that he sucks. Died um, a couple years ago, so he wouldn't be back. But and then uh, the prophecy, it's Christopher Walken. What can you say? The sequels movie. are fucking horrible, yeah. but number one is great. Great movie. So 1995 is my number four. For my number three, I had a tie that I could not break. Both of these years brought us 11 excellent films. The first is 1980, gave us Altered States, Anthropophagus, Cannibal Holocaust, The Changeling, Encounters of the Spooky Kind, Friday the 13th, The Monster Club, Motel Hell, Prom Night, The Shining, and The Watcher in the Woods. And also the year you were born. Also the, there, yeah. If you guys want to listen to our uh, previous episode few episodes back, maybe 10, 20 episodes back, we did our top five horror movies from the year we were born. And that was uh, Dom's year. Yeah. So. And then my tie is the year that I turned 21, 2001, 
also 11 movies, and this this has a lot of... It may have something to do with the fact that I was doing a lot of hallucinogens at this point, <laughs> but the, these are some movies that have really stuck with me out of 2001. The Attic Expedition, Bones, Brotherhood of the Wolf, The Bunker, Cradle of Fear, Dagon, Faust Love of the Dam, Mulva the Zombie Ass Kicker, The Others, Session 9, and the movie that I have mentioned on this show more than my favorite horror movie ever made, 13 Ghosts. <laughs> yeah, you have mentioned it. More I, than it deserves, probably. <laughs> I love 13 Ghosts, man. It's it a, is good. It's a fucking gem. It's good. <laughs> but yeah, you have, it's made many, many Dom lists. <laughs> All right. My number three. 1986. You got The Fly. Friday the 13th, Part 6. Jason Lives. The best Friday the 13th, yeah. in my opinion. Class Newcomb High. Aliens. From Beyond. House, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2, Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer, Blue Velvet, Stand By Me. That's a fucking epic year. Solid, solid year. Epic year. Yeah. So, And I love me some Blue Velvet. Not necessarily horror, but makes my list because it deserves to be talked about. It, it's, it can't be classified as anything Packed else. Blue Ribbon! <laughs> that hurt to belt it out. Yeah. Like <laughs> Alright, number two. Bringing us... An even dozen movies that I thought were excellent is 1987. Also my number two. Yeah? Yes. Angel Heart, Bad Taste, Blood Diner, The Gate, Hellraiser, The Lost Boys, Monster Squad, Munchies, Near Dark, Necromantic, Predator, and Prince of Darkness. Creep Show 2. Yeah. Evil Dead 2. Yeah. You didn't say that? I left off sequels. Oh, okay. And, unless I thought that the Hellraiser. sequel was Did you really say Hellraiser? I, I did. Yes. You say Nightmare on Elm Street 3 The Dream Warriors. You didn't say that. I did not. It's a sequel. And you said The Lost Boys. So, yeah. 1987, also my number two. Great fucking year. One of my favorites ever. That's why it's my number two. Excellent Go. year. Yeah. All right. Number one. My unplanned favorite year for horror movies. But this movie brought us an impressive, or this year brought us an impressive 14 excellent movies. 2008. Brought us Dance of the Dead, Dead Girl, How to Be a Serial Killer, Let the Right One In, Martyrs, Midnight Meat Train, Mirrors, Auto, Pontypool, Regurgitated Sacrifice, Repo the Genetic Opera, The Strangers, Tokyo Gore Police, and the all-time classic Zombie Strippers. As well as Eden Lake, Offspring, and The Loved Ones, and Red. Was that your number one also? No, that's oh. my honorable mention. Okay. But yeah, I love 2008. It was almost my number five also. I had to go with nostalgia. Like there was, I had to go with 95 and 96 for the nostalgia. I couldn't yeah. leave them off my list. <laughs> you know, otherwise right. it would have been 14 and 8. So yeah, good shit. <clears throat> All right. As I die right now. <clears throat> the finish line is in sight. Yes. Give, just pass me one more fucking burrito. I'm ready to hate it all. <laughs> Suicide by burrito. <laughs> I, I promise I wasn't just fucking shoveling it in my face. It was when I coughed it up. It was like, what the fuck? Maybe my saliva and everything just ate it down. But it was just a tiny little piece. Yeah, like, it's, How kinda, it it's a natural response. Like <laughs> as a last gasp, like your body will, will just fucking purge everything. Yeah, when, when you're in that situation. Yeah, I've seen it happen at my work. Thing. Like with crazy, like projectile, like 15 foot projectile vomiting. Yeah, people were choking on their food. Yeah, yeah, it's fucking crazy. But my number one on your list: the year you were born, 1980. Just like we did our top five movies from the year we were born. Didn't take me long to know what my number one was. In fact, when we came up with this entire list, I always knew my number one would be 1985. Friday the 13th, A New Beginning, Life Force, Fright Night, Return of the Living Dead, Day of the Dead, Cannibal Holocaust, Guinea Pig, The Flower of Flesh and Blood, and Reanimator. Guinea Pig came out in 1985? Yeah. Jesus. That was that old. That's... The fucking year, man. It's a good year. Return of the Living Dead and Reanimator in the same year and Fright Night and Life... And all those... Ah! Yeah. That's a fucking year. And that's the year I was born, so that's... I think my whole top five of that year is <laughs> in my listing I just told you about. Yeah. But yeah, fuck. I love 1985 movies. Great year. Great year. So I've got some honorable mentions. I'll let your, uh, I'll let you rest your, uh, rest your throat while I go through these. First one... Only brought us two movies, but it may be the most significant year for horror ever. 
and that's 1931, bringing us Dracula and Frankenstein in the same yeah, year. Yeah, fuck yeah. Got the ball rolling. There were horror movies before them, but they made the genre. Yeah, they legit. made it actually to where like it could be a profitable genre that people would watch. Yeah. Um, 1977 brought us Eraserhead, The Hills Have Eyes, and Suspiria. Strong year. 1979 brought us Alien, The Amityville Horror, which I don't like, but I understand its significance. Driller Killer and Phantasm. 1984 brought us Chud, Gremlins, A Nightmare on Elm Street, and The Toxic Avenger. And 1989 brought us Puppet Master, Shocker, Society, Tetsuo the Iron Man, and Warlock. Wow, that's right where my honorable mentions start, too. <laughs> 1990, Bride of Reanimator, Flatliners, The Exorcist 3, It, Nightbreed, Wild at Heart, Jacob's Ladder. That's a fucking strong that's year. That's a solid year. 1992, Dead Alive, Candyman, Hellraiser 3, Romper Stomper, Bad Lieutenant. I forgot about Rumper Stomper. I fucking... Oh, that's a good movie. You want to borrow the DVD when you leave? I got it. Yeah, really? Got I, it. I haven't yeah. seen that in years. <laughs> 1993, believe it or not. Body Bags, Kronos, Body Melt, Jason Goes to Hell, Leprechaun, Necronomicon, Needful Things, Return of the Living Dead 3, True Romance. Wow. 2000, The Convent, American Psycho, Ginger Snap, Final Destination, Hellraiser Inferno, Leprechaun in the Hood, mm-hmm. Banner Do No Good, Shadow of the Vampire, and Spiders. You know, in my research, I learned something about Shadow of the Vampire that I didn't know. It was made by the same guy who made Begotten. Really? Yeah. That's fucking yeah, weird. E- e- Those Elias, are polar opposites. Yeah, marriage. Like a, like a fucking art black and white film about gods being born in people's intestines. Yeah. As opposed to like a... like. In, like, hip, like, oh, look, we know we're making a movie, but we're making a movie kind of, yeah. like... like vampire, Almost a Saturday Night Live vampire, vampire subtle movie. comedy. Yeah. <laughs> 2003, Beyond Reanimator, Freddy vs. Jason, High Tension, Monster, House of a Thousand Corpses. It's pretty good. Yeah. 2005, The Descent, Devil's Rejects, 2001, Maniacs, Hostel, Wolf Creek, A History of Violence. You said 2008 and 2014, so that's it for me. So... If you guys are listening to this, you've got some homework. If you haven't seen any of those movies that we've listed on this uh, epic list of movies, you got to go pick them up and watch them. And upcoming production values in the show are dramatically going to increase. I'm not supposed to talk about the lawsuit against El Monterey Corporation. Right. But... Looking to get a nice set, settlement. Yeah. At least six figures. What if they... What if My they pain and suffering. Six figures in burritos. Uh, they can pay me in burritos. Yeah. I'll still eat their product. Yeah. El Monterey bean burritos. When when it's a hot summer day and you don't want to cook, you don't want to heat up that oven, you don't want to heat up that skillet, you just want to microwave something. It's got to be something cheap, got to be something fast, got to be something easy. So when I feel that way, I reach for El Monterey bean and cheese burritos. <laughs> Well, if, if you can't sue them, you can always get uh, what the money fuck? From them. Why am I advertising the product that almost killed me? Yeah, you know, I, I think that El Monterey burritos are sort of like our Ike Turner. Pretty much, you know, they 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 try, always come back. They, they try to choke you out, but I'll you come back. come back. Yeah, yep. I'll always come back. All right. Well, let's plug a couple things before we uh, shut down this episode. First of all, I want to plug some of my own music. I just uh, this week re-released some old music that, I guess re-released isn't the right term, some old music that I'd never released before. It's uh, some early an early project that I worked on that sort of laid the groundwork for what became my Mechanical Ghost project. And uh, it's available at mechanicalghost.bandcamp.com. It's called uh, The Gaki Sessions, Sep- Seppuku Party 1702. It's a little six-track EP of industrial clangy noise and weird vocals and shit that uh, I have completely remastered so it doesn't sound assy anymore. And uh, I I would like it if you guys go and pick it up. It's only five bucks. Or if you're a Patreon patron, you've already got it for free because it's there on our Patreon. Yeah, if you're a $20 or uh, more patron, uh, you get all the music, both of our music, a lot of it. Yep. You get the JD Horror DVD, which I still haven't uploaded yet. I'm just waiting on the guy who makes the DVDs for me. I still have a bunch of physical DVDs, but he's gonna make it to where like it can work with the menu and stuff. Oh, like an ISO. Yeah, yeah. And you can do it like perfectly, right. um, or I could make it AVI if, if people don't want to do that, you know. But I'm waiting on to do it. I'm gonna do it right. I'm gonna upload it. It's the only thing that's been promised that hasn't been delivered on the Patreon so far, other than our monthly videos, which the patrons. Uh, I almost died. Yeah, I'm sick, and as I fuck. had to move. Dom had to move. 
I just been standing cabinet doors, redoing my whole kitchen in my house. Been busy as fuck, but we're not going to miss an episode now. You guys, we'll, we're going to record extra for the bank because we will never miss an episode with with your support. We're not going to do it. That's right. Next week, no new episode. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, go to our Patreon. Check out a postmortem show at Patreon and uh, become a patron. Yes, some and awesome videos coming us. soon for you patrons that are waiting. Videos are coming soon. We got some things. Why didn't in the you works. video to yourself almost dying? Uh, just I wasn't really thinking about the mm-hmm. the patron program you gotta get your when shit I was together, choking man. myself out, dying that, on a bean burrito. That would have been big money. I accepted death. Yeah, I accepted death. I resigned myself to death. I was laying on the floor, not even struggling anymore. My vision was going black. Wow! All of a sudden, beans flew out of my face. <laughs> Hank skinnyed that shit. <laughs> Hank skinnyed that shit. It was a ghost. A ghost helped me. <laughs> it was Biff's dad. Thank you for taking care of my son. <laughs> my, my poor retarded son. <laughs> All right. So I guess as H... Oh, wait. No HP Lovecraft yet. If you cannot be a patron, if you cannot afford to give us $1 a month, please go to iTunes, Apple Music, Stitcher, Whatever your podcast source is, subscribe and give us a five-star review if you think we deserve it. If you don't think we deserve it, don't bother reviewing because we don't want no four-star reviews. <laughs> Fuck <Yeah>. you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, guys. And as H.P. Lovecraft once said, as he was laying on the floor accepting death <laughs> before projectile vomiting out his 1920s era El Monterey bean burrito. <laughs> <laughs> Full of tam- tampon frappuccino. <laughs> if it smells like fish, throw the fucker back. <laughs> <laughs>